And um, he is, uh, by the way, this video is, is being used by a number of leftists uh, to say, look, you see, nobody believes in Ayn Rand anymore, right? There are no objectivists in the, uh, in the trenches. You know, the, the saying, there are no atheists in the trenches. Well, now there are no objectivists in the trenches, so there are no free marketers in the trenches. Uh, look, even Mark, even Mark Cuban has basically thrown Ayn Rand under the bus. And he, he doesn't really, but he, he basically throws his own beliefs under the bus or his own prior beliefs, or if he had any prior beliefs. Now, you'll know, just before we get to this, I did a video a while back about Mark Cuban and his defense of capitalism and noted how much of a pragmatist he was in that video. So even irrespective of Ayn Rand, irrespective of what he says here, which I think it takes it much further along his rejection of capitalism, he's never been a good defender of capitalism. He's always been... Uh, his whole approach has been tinged with altruism and collectivism and, and anti-principle. And I think that's why he didn't read Atlas Shrugged, because he knew that it would challenge all of that, and he didn't want it to be challenged. So it's, it's been, um, you know, Kubin has been, um, has not been a defender of capitalism, ever, 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 ever. So it's not like he's completely changed. It's not like coronavirus has completely changed him. But he has gone from a compromising, moderate support of capitalism to an out-and-out -out statist, borderline, you know, uh, you know, statist. I wouldn't say socialist, but borderline socialist. Let's listen to what... And, and if you listen to the whole interview, then you'll get more of a flavor of all the proposals now he supports, all the things... He wants government to do all the interventions, all the stimulus, all the things that are going, that are, that are happening. All right. Here we, uh, here we go. Julia again. Um, you know, in the last several weeks now, I'm sure you've probably had a lot of time to do quite a bit of reflecting, and I know we all have pretty much. And, and I'm wondering if in this period, if you've changed your mind on anything, whether it's, you know, policy, the role of government, or, you know, the role of corporations, if there's anything that's kind of shifted for you that maybe even surprised you. Everything. A hundred everything. So this coronavirus has basically changed everything for Mark Cuban. That's how solidly he held his beliefs before. Now, reality should, you should be open to changing your mind based on new facts of reality, but what exactly has happened in coronavirus that should have shifted your beliefs 100%? That completely changed what you believe. I mean, you, you have to wonder. Now, it's true, the coronavirus is a good time for reflection. It is, it, it is presenting some real challenges and some real questions, but everything... Wow. All right. I, you, you know, everything is easy when you don't really believe in anything solidly, when you don't really, you're not really principled about anything. I mean, I read Ayn Rand. I was, you know, Howard Rourke, you know. He was never Howard Rourke. Libertarian. I was, you know, I, I thought government had a role, but big, smaller government was always better than bigger government. And that all changed. See, that, and that's part of what happens with most people who have what they call libertarian positions or free market positions, is they don't, you know, and I think this is true of Mark Cuban, but I think it's true of a lot of people, they don't know what it's really about. They, they, some government, but small government, you know, not too big government. What's the principle? What's the principle? And you have to be able to articulate a principle of why limited government, limited by what, limited to what. And of course, fine, Rand, the limit is limit for the protection of individual rights. By the way, that too is the limitation placed on the government by the founders. I think the founders viewed government as its sole responsibility is the protection of individual rights. But when you have it as a floating thing, oh, big government is not good, it, then it's easy to give up on that. Big government is not efficient then it's easy to give up on that. You need, if you're going to have an understanding of why do you hold that big government is not good? Is it because it's not efficient? Is it because politicians don't do as good of a job as the private sector? I mean, all of that is true for most things, but is that the fundamental? Is that why 
you're against big government? Or is there principle behind it? Is there something you clearly believe that the government's role to do is, and it, it, there's a conceptual framework for that. And that conceptual framework is all about individual rights, what they are, how they need to be defended, and what, what, why you have to have government to defend them. That's the argument against anarchy. Why you have to have limited government to defend them. Why government is limited by them. And why a constitution must limit the role of government to the protection of individual rights and nothing else. Why anything else is that abomination is a violation of rights. So all of that is a real intellectual project, which if you're going to defend capitalism, you have to know. You have to know. So let's see where he's moved now that he's no longer a free market guy. You know, if you were to ask me four months ago um, whether I thought we could lose 26 million jobs and potentially many more within the space of a month, I would have said you're crazy. Now, I wonder if maybe we've lost 26 million jobs because of the government not taking its job protecting individual rights seriously. Not. Not living up to its responsibility to protect individual rights, which in this context would have meant taking this virus seriously early on, and as we've talked about, and I don't want to talk about it anymore, tested, isolated, tr uh, tested, tracked, and isolated. Done what North Korea did. Sorry, what South Korea did. Done what Taiwan did. But our government defaulted on its responsibility to protect individual rights. Defaulted on a scientific responsibility, and then, as a knee-jerk reaction to the fact that, oh my God, this is a real disease, people are really dying, we need to do something, the knee-jerk reaction was to shut the economy down, to shut everybody's lives down, to force people. Now, the economy would have taken a hit anyway. The Swedish economy, where they've left the economy basically open, has taken, is taking a major hit. Nothing like the hit we're taking. Nothing like the hit we're going to take. But even when it comes to losing 26 million jobs, the 26 million jobs just evaporate because just because of COVID? And even if they did, let's say we'd had a virus much worse than COVID, which had caused businesses to shut down, not because of government, but voluntarily, which had really caused 26 million people to lose their jobs. Okay. Is the, so what? You couldn't imagine that? I get that. But does that alter your entire philosophy of life? Only if you didn't have one. Only if you didn't have principles. And only if your thinking is fundamentally collectivist. Ooh, so what do we do about society? Instead of thinking about how individuals should probably prepare themselves for losing their job. Individuals should probably prepare themselves for a virus or other things. no way that's going to happen and so dogma's got to go out the window and so you know a federal job dogma should always be out the window program i would have been against that now he's for federal jobs program really and this is going to protect 26 million jobs how by hiring those people with what money money taken from whom and what would those people do with that money Is it not taking, giving jobs to some while killing future jobs for others? Is it not taking from our children and grandchildren and giving to people right now? Is it not forcing all of our, of our lives to slow, pathetic economic growth into the future and limiting innovation and real growth? The consequences to a government run, real consequences, dangerous consequences that every socialist country in the world has experienced. Why won't we learn? Federal minimum wage. Federal minimum wage is not full. Probably 15. Why? Why a federal minimum wage? What has changed? What has the coronavirus done to now say a federal minimum wage may, makes sense? And, 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 and what about the poor kids who won't be able to ever earn a federal minimum wage because they can't produce at that level? Then what, you give them money so that they don't work? Or maybe, maybe then you, you do AOC's program, which is what you're suggesting, a federal work program where, you know, the government employs them at $15 an hour. And again, where does that money come from? At what expense? At whose expense? At what job's expense? Where would that money have gone? What jobs would that money have created? 
I mean, uh, Cook says, Cuban who God's Ayn Rand is dogma, then he probably means he accepted Rand and free markets of faith. No, I don't think he ever accepted Ayn Rand on faith. I, I don't think, I think he accepted Ayn Rand on emotion. I think he accepted how it worked on emotion. I don't think he ever understood Ayn Rand. I don't think he read Ayn Rand extensively. All he read was the fountainhead. And I don't think he ever was really free markets. I think whenever he was pushed, whenever an issue came up, he reverted to a collectivistic, pragmatic solution. What Mark Cuban has never been is principled. He has no principles. He stands by no principles. And, and I don't think he's afraid of free market competition, Brad says. I don't think, I mean, the idea that people who are not against the, who are against the free market just don't want the competition against their own businesses, I don't think that's true. I think he just doesn't understand principles. He doesn't believe in principles. He doesn't hold principles. He is, you know, he sees a problem, and he'll say this in a minute, you know, he sees a problem. We need a solution. The problem is people don't have jobs. Okay, hire them. Who's going to hire them? Well, the government can do it. The government, has, the government can print money. I can't do it. I don't have money. The government can do it, right? That's how he thinks. No principles, pragmatic, on-the-moment solutions, um, no real understanding of economics, no understanding of economics. The fact, and I said this about Trump many times, the fact that you can make money in the business world does not mean anything about your knowledge of economics. I know lots of business people who are rabid leftists and have no understanding of economics, nothing. Just so us on. And yet they've made huge amounts of money in the markets. So it is not true that business people know economics. They know business. They know how to create value. They know how to offer you that value. And good for them. In this case, at the Mavericks, he, I, I think he's good at marketing. He's good at running this business, whatever, however you want to define the business. But he doesn't understand economics, and he doesn't, again, hold the principles, individual rights, for example, necessary to be able to defend in your own mind, never mind other people, the idea of freedom, the idea of capitalism. He is a perfect example of a pragmatic business person who can solve problems within a particular realm over a particular time frame, but cannot, cannot think in principle over long ranges outside of his specific domain of expertise that there's just so many things that I think we need to do now and you know and that that's what entrepreneurs do that's what you know leaders do you when you you face the circumstances you have and you deal with it and dealing with it means throw out all your principles and just come up with solutions you know like locking all of our lives up like shutting down the, the economy in our lives like that's a solution that's powerful leadership right instead of the actual solutions which is having a real plan you know, deploying resources to actually execute on the protection of individual rights. No. I mean, we want these knee-jerk solutions that have nothing to do with science, that have nothing to do with economics, that have nothing to do with long-term consequences. To hell with long-term consequences. What matters is what's right now. People don't have a job. Let's just use the government to give them a job. Effectively, all these trillion-dollar investments are a put for, and, but this put has got to be not for the, the wealthy and not for big business, but for working people. So he wants a trillion dollars investment. It's not an investment. It's a redistribution. It's not an investment for working people. And why does he want this? Why does he want it to go to working class people and not to rich people? Now, he doesn't give the altruist reason, which the poor, the suffering. No, no. He gives the economically ignorant answer. He gives the AOC answer. He gives the Bernie Sanders answer. And this is why I've said there's no differences between people left and right these days in terms of their understanding of economics. They all agree. Here's why we need to give the money to the working class and make sure that the rich don't get it. Unless we lift up from the bottom, we're not going to have any consumer demand, and it doesn't matter how much liquidity is in the system, the risk hasn't left the system. So what we need in the system is consumer demand. Now, why would consumers demand when, you know, what are they going to demand when nothing's being produced? No answer. 
I did a whole show on production as the primary, not consumption, why consumption is not the driver, why Keynes is wrong when he says that it's all about aggregate demand. It's not about aggregate demand. It's about supply, and if you assure supply, then you assure jobs, then you assure specific demand. It's not about lifting up from the bottom. It's about reducing uncertainty for entrepreneurs. It's about increased investments. But to do that, what you need is not to increase demand. What are people going to use their checks for if they get a check right now? What are they going to do with it? They're going to buy groceries, more toilet paper, and they're going to leave the money in the bank because they don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. There's not going to be demand for hotels. There's not going to be demand for airplanes. There's not going to be demand for computers. There's not going to be demand for the kind of products that we actually need demand for if we're going to get out of this, which is demand for the products that actually grow and enhance human life. No, because people, because of the uncertainty, because of the risk, people are worried about their dinner. They're worried about their lives right now. And that doesn't help the economy. What you need right now is to reduce the uncertainty. Now, that's hard. It's hard without doing what you should have done to begin with. And I know I repeat myself, which was test, track, isolate. Without that, without knowing the magnitude of the problem, without knowing the magnitude of this disease, the real deadliness of this disease, the impact it really has on, our, on the lives, and you know, uncertainty is going to be rampant by shutting down the economy, by telling people, oh, my God, you're all going to die. Whether you're so, Mark, based on what you just whether you're 20 or whether you're 70, you're all going to die. That kind of hysteria is what creates uncertainty that shuts down an economy that makes it so difficult to grow the economy in the future. Giving people fifteen hundred dollar checks is not going to change that. Now, this crisis is caused by government by the government response, is caused by the virus, but, the, but we could have handled the virus if we had a decent government. We cannot handle the virus because the government is making it a thousand times more difficult for us to deal with the reality out there. Because we're not getting the information we should have getting and because they're panicking us and because they're making it legal for us to produce. Now, this guy asks a smoky Ayn Rand question, too. Watch this. Said this question will annoy Dagny Taggart and uh, John <laughs> Gold. But it's not the question that will annoy Dagny and John Gold. It's the answer that's going to annoy them. Ayn Rand reference. Why not, after we get past, as we slowly start to bring up, why not, based on what you just said about demand, why not have the government, there are 200 million adults in the United States send every adult $1,000 a month. I think, uh, forgive me because I get zeroed out. That would be uh, roughly, uh, we're talking about $200 billion no. a month. Wouldn't yeah. that be a more effective way to deal with what we're dealing with as opposed no. to these programs? Absolutely not. Look, and I know the UBIers are like Bitcoin. So this is a UBI question. And, and notice here Mark's answer. It's completely collectivistic. It's completely... I mean, he, just listen to how he, how he phrases this. It's, it's truly stunning. They're going to come and attack when I tell you what I'm about to tell you. Um, but first, I'm not against UBI for a partner who stays home to watch children, right? That makes sense because that's a job. and that Yeah, so let's redistribute wealth from all of us to your partner who doesn't want to go and work or chooses not to go work. And it could be a rational decision. I'm not saying it's a bad decision. But why am I supposed to pay her? Let her husband pay her. So UBI is good, redistribution of wealth is good from people who have jobs to people who don't have jobs. That Mark Cuban is on record for supporting. But I'm going to quote um, JFK or paraphrase JFK. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Because we need... Now that is one of the most evil political statements ever made. That is one of the most evil political statements ever made. Ask not what the government can do for you, but what you can do for the country. That's pure collectivism. That's pure statism. 
That's pure fascism. It was uttered by John F. Kennedy, a pragmatist, unprincipled politician, although compared to our current politicians, he, he seems like an a, a epitome of virtue. But what does that really mean? Remember, our government, i.e. the American government, is our servant. And it is exactly about what the government can do for me. It is exactly about how the government should or shouldn't protect my rights. That's what the government is there for. It's to serve me in the one function that I need them to serve me in, and that is the protection of my rights. It's not my responsibility to do for the government anything. Respect the law. I mean, Ayn Rand talks about this in uh, The Fascist New Frontier, which is an essay she wrote in the 1960s about uh, the John F. K. administration and about this kind of attitude. That your, you as a citizen, your job, your responsibility is to government, to the state. No, that's not America. That's not American. The state is your servant, there to protect you, there to defend you, there to respect and protect your rights. And otherwise, leave you free to live your life based on your mind in pursuit of your values. That's what America means. But Mark, like most people, a collect is a collectivist. What does the country need? And is an opposition to, um, to uh, you know, a, a um, blanket payment for everybody, universal basic income, is that it's not good for the country because it provides incentives for people not to work. Let's listen. People to contribute and while you be not to work to contribute sorry I, you know god forbid you work and you earn a living and use that living to pursue your own self-interested values no 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 that's not good it's about contributing so you work so that you can pay taxes so that you can create ec economic activity for your fellow man it's great for um, individuals and gives them a lot of creative control and personal control over their life and that's great Right now, we need people to contribute to the economy. And if that means a federally guaranteed job where you're working as a crossing guard managed by the folks at AmeriCorps or the people in the Peace Corps or whatever organization, then I'm fine with that. If it's a federally um, created job for te um, testing and tracing, that is going to um, contribute to the economy because we need people to do those jobs. Otherwise, Notice that those jobs are not necessarily... Now, I'm all for the testing and tracking, but... He wants federally, uh, you know, paid for jobs, jobs that are basically digging ditches and filling ditches. No productive value because he, like AOC and like Bernie Sanders and like m many people, the Keynesians out there, believe that what drives the economy is demand. What drives the economy is not production. It's not the work. It's the fact that they get paid and then they go and consume. Now, he would like them to do things that add value not value as the market dictates, value as Mark, you know, Mark Cuban dictates, value as the bureaucracy dictates, value as democracy dictates, value as the state dictates. All behind. So maybe in another world, UBI is a great solution, but where we are today, other than for partners staying home with kids, I'm not a fan. All right, I think, I think you get the picture. Uh, there's nothing, you know, he basically goes on and on about, um, about this stuff. So Mark Cuban is a statist, a pragmatist, a collectivist. I don't think there's anything really new here. Um, because he mentions Ayn Rand, I thought it would be a good idea to kind of present it. But I showed you a defense that Mark Cuban made of capitalism a few months ago. Nothing has changed. Uh, he's just gotten worse. He's become more of a statist more of a collectivist, and he's more explicit about it. So the whole idea of, I'm against UBI because I want people to contribute. I don't want to just give them a check. I want them to work for that check. Work for whom? Not for themselves. Work for the state. Work for the benefit of the state. 
And that is the essence of fascism. That is the essence of sacrificing the individual, sacrificing lives, sacrificing futures for the sake of the state today, for the sake of the collective, for the sake of the common good, the public interest, fill in the blank, any one of those. That is what, that is what, you know, this is all about. And, and this is not unusual. So, you know, Malkabun is not unusual here. It's, it's, this is the common belief. This is the popular belief. Left and right don't disagree on this. There's no difference today between left and right on these issues. It's, there's no individualism left today in the political spectrum. There's nobody in the entire political spectrum who stands even mildly for individualism. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. using the super chat and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time so I'll do it again maybe we'll get some more today um, if you like what you're hearing if you appreciate what I'm doing then I appreciate your support uh, those of you who don't yet support the show please take this opportunity go to yourronbrookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com yourronbrookshow and um, and and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to keep this uh, to keep this going. I'm not sure when the next.